This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here tonight. It's an absolute honor uh, to be here at IHMC, and, and you should know that um, your institute here locally is known all over the world for the good work that it does, and um, you should feel lucky and proud as a community for um, what they bring and all of the scientists and all the families and all the people's lives that have been changed by the Institute, both located here. I've also lectured at the one located in Ocala, which I would also recommend uh, um, visiting that. It's a beautiful location as well. And so there are hundreds of people here, but the lives that are touched because of the work that happens here are you know, a multiplier of that. And so thank you for the invitation to speak. Ken Ford and his um, group have really put together a class act and it's just, it's an honor um, and pleasure to, to be here. I don't want to uh, intimidate anyone or, or uh, make you think that, that, that I'm some super smart, brilliant genius or that when I see patients that, um, that I have like all the answers to, to everything, nor do I want you to think that, you know, as, uh, as we um, address problems like Parkinson disease, that these are easy and, uh, and that the solutions are easy. We've said that Parkinson is the most complex disease in clinical medicine, period. The most complex disease in clinical medicine, period. On the record, as saying this to the government, not that the government listens, but, uh, <laughs> but and you know, why do I say that? Because it's the only disease that has over 20 motor features like tremor, stiffness, slowness, and all these walking problems. And, and over 20 non-motor features, depression, apathy, other dysfunctions. And it has all of these medicines, dozens of different medicines, and it changes over time. And it's the only disease that I know of that you give a dose of a medicine or something like dopamine and people wake up and they start to, to do amazing things. And we can operate and tap into the circuitries of these patients. And we have a, a host of, of things that can be offered to patients. And, and families, and so this is an extremely complex disease, but one where we have made significant progress, and something that I think one of the themes that I want you to leave with is, is to have hope. But don't get over like enthusiastic about the things that I'm telling you, like I know everything, I don't. I tell all of my patients, I'm like your cabinet advisor, and you know the half-life of cabinet advisors, right? <laughs> Uh, I said, listen, I'll give you the best advice I can, having seen thousands of patients, some of whom from different countries and different regions with these various diseases. I'll give you the best advice I can, and you can take it or not take it. But if you don't take it, tell me what you do so I can learn from it, because that's how we learn, and sometimes we're not, we're not right. And sometimes patients don't listen to what we say, and we learn from that as well. And so I'll tell you just a little a little story about this guy uh, on, the, on the screen who's, who's pretty well known. And every once in a while, his wife would phone me up and, and she would say, Dr. Oaken, Dr. Oaken, you gotta get on the phone. You gotta tell Muhammad he's not listening. You know, he's not taking his, his medications. And, um, and he's not doing what you told him to. He's not exercising. And uh, so, you know, so they shift the phone, a little bit of ruckus get on the phone, he go, oh, he said, I'd say, Muhammad, you got to take your medications, you know, you got to exercise, you got to do all these things that are going to make your life better with Parkinson disease, and he would, he'd, you know, I hear a pause on the other end, and he'd go, ain't no joking, Dr. Oaken. <laughs> <laughs> the point of the story is that that with these diseases, the courage that people have to meet them is as important as it is any individual recommendation that you give patients. And so, so just uh, being able to, um, to navigate through these diseases, I think, 
uh, human nature, it's important. This is our group. We're located at the University of Florida. This is where we practice. We're a, a completely interdisciplinary group. And anything that I say to you today, please don't give me the credit. These are the people that, that, um, that deserve the credit. We work together in teams, and that's how we make discoveries, and that's how we um, deliver care. And you know, I'm proud to say that over the years, and this is an article that appeared recently in JAMA Neurology about the idea of how we think care should be administered in diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis and many other neurological maladies. How should we be delivering care? Well, we developed this model a number of years ago called a service and science hub, okay? And the idea is, is, is that as you come to see the doctor, you're lucky to get parking. You're lucky to get an appointment, and you're lucky to get out before lunch, even though the appointment may only be a half an hour or an hour. And this is a problem when we're trying to take care of people that have chronic neurological diseases, some of which, like Parkinson, are the most complex diseases in clinical medicine, period. And so we have to develop better systems to take care of these patients. And so one of the care systems that we've promoted and built a, a center around is this idea of a service and science hub, service for the care of patients, science to push the horizons forward, all under one roof. All of the specialists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuropsychologists, physical, occupational, speech, swallowing therapists, social workers, everybody in one place and making sure you can see them all on the same day and, by the way, have access to research and clinical trials. And we want the patients to be able to enroll in research. So every subject is a potential research subject. So when we collect data from you, we can put it into a database and we can learn from it and other diseases can learn from it. And in that way, we can track your outcomes and we can improve your health over time by better understanding your disease. And so the first thing that I want to say, the first point that I want to make is that I think that we're doing it wrong. Because that doesn't sound too complicated, but in a way, the value-based system that we provide for patients who have Parkinson and Alzheimer's and other chronic neurological diseases, in my view, is wrong. We need to be developing a valued system where, where patients can be taken care of better. And by the way, these systems have the potential to reduce hip fractures, to reduce morbidity, to reduce mortality, reduce nursing home placement, keep people in their homes and healthier and happier. So who's for those things? I'm for those things. And so we need to rethink. And so when you go home tonight, think about how screwed up the healthcare system is. But think about now we've got to develop the data and the, the information to try to drive to something better. Because I think that our kids and the next generation deserve something better. So we would like to, to build these uh, for the future uh, of, of healthcare and particularly of neurological diseases. So I'm often asked because I, you know, Ken says I like 10. And I, the reason I like 10 is because I, I think it's easier to keep track of numbers. You know, you say people give you 100 different things. But if you say, I got these things, do these things, it's manageable. And so I think if we, if we start talking at people, we're over their heads. How are we going to actually affect their lives? And so we've wrote, written a couple of books that, um, that have been out there. And I'll tell you, of all the hundreds of research articles that I've read, I've been totally humbled by the fact that more people read those little 10 books than any of the hundreds of research articles that, I, that I've written in a multiplier. I just got back from China. I was there for three days, lectured in seven institutions in two different cities in China. It was, it's World Parkinson Month, so it was World Parkinson Day, and I met a lot of patients with Parkinson in China, and they look like the patients in Pensacola who have Parkinson too. This is something that, that unites no matter what's happening in different cultures. And we have to think about what are the things we can do to help people to live better lives. And it turns out that in the Eastern cultures, so we're in the Western Hemisphere, in case anybody's confused. <laughs> in the Eastern cultures, people are, it, they, the value is much greater on how well you live your life. 
And so when we start to think about breakthroughs and therapies and secrets and everything, how about one breakthrough I suggest to you, and that's that we take better care of people and we help people to better lives. And so tailoring uh, an approach to that is important. So I'm going to share not only a, a, just a, a few things with you tonight about approaches to this, but I'm also going to share with you, um, you know, maybe a few things that if you have Parkinson or know somebody with Parkinson or another similar disease might help with their, with their life. And so these four simple words, you have Parkinson disease, these are going to pierce the hearts and drain the dreams of 50,000 or more people per year. But there's a big problem that's coming here. And you know what the problem is? The problem is, is that we're making people live longer. And as we make people live longer, and the greatest innovation of the last century, okay, from 1901 to 1999, was doubling of the lifespan. It wasn't inventing all these great devices like Ken has. And trust me, his devices are really cool. I saw them today. It was doubling of the lifespan, okay? And when you double the lifespan, and you're, now we're having people live longer than our, us as a machine that we were designed to live. We were not designed to live this long. And so just from aging, you can lose cells and dopaminergic cells and begin to get the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And we have this mindset, and our mindset is wrong. We need to change the minds of people about the diagnosis of Parkinson because there's so many things that you can do with this disease. And so one of the points I'd like to make is change your mind about this disease. It's, it's not the worst disease that you can get. This is the Chinese uh, philosopher Lu Jun, and I, I love Lu Jun uh, for a number of reasons, not just because I was, I was just in China, I loved him before I went to, to China, but it's because of his philosophy. And he has this very simple philosophy that he writes about with hope, and hope is so important to patients, particularly with diseases. And he says, hope cannot be said to exist, nor can it be said not to exist. It's just like roads across the earth. And before there were roads, there were people, and people had to walk to make those roads, okay? And so when you think about these diseases, we really have to walk together. We've got to care for the patients together. We've got to develop the clinical trials together. It's the only way that we are going to, to make a difference uh, for the next generation. And so one thing that we've learned is, is that, that patients plant the seeds of faith. They learn to grow hope, and they have discovered core values with this disease that they can live with this disease despite it being a chronic thing that's in the background, they can still live a good life with the disease. So one thing I'm going to tell you is, is change your mind about this disease. If you're negative about Parkinson's disease, be positive. There's a lot of things that we can do. And when you say you have Parkinson's disease, when your, your doctor says it, they're doing you a disservice if they allow you to walk out of the office without having hope. Parkinson is a pandemic. And we're, we're working, surprise, we're working on another book about this, the Parkinson pandemic led by Ray Dorsey and a number of us are coming together and looking at this data. And the data is absolutely staggering if you look at it. So five million people in the world's 10 most populous countries and there's way more than 10 countries. You know that because every time an airplane disappears, there's, they say there's 50 countries looking for their, their people, right? But there's way more than 50 countries. But in the world's 10 most populous countries, at least five million people with Parkinson. In the year 2030, this number will more than double. Folks, that's not linear growth. That's way more than linear growth. It's because as the population ages, we're gonna get more. So China has the most, but China will grow just like America will grow. The burden will be bigger, and we're gonna bankrupt ourselves if we don't come up with the systems to address this. So what are the secrets? You know, what are these, these secrets? And it's funny, because Ken said that one of the books was translated into um, you know, multiple languages, and it went to Japan, they changed the title. And I said, what the hell? What do you mean you changed the title of the book? And they said, well, in the Japanese culture, secrets means there's something going on behind the, <laughs> the, uh, the wife's back. And so I said, okay, so it'll be tips for Japan. <laughs> so, so Jillian Lawrence uh, said in her book, she said, I look for a sign where to go next. You never know when you're going to get one, but even the most faithless among us are waiting to be proven wrong. Okay? 
And I love this quote. And the first secret is, is understand what you have and what you don't have. And so if you have Parkinson's disease, you don't have Alzheimer's disease. You don't have amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. You don't have a brain tumor. So with all due respect, we have to tell patients what they have and what their horizon is. And if they don't understand that from the get-go and getting out of the gate, we've had patients who have spent 5, 10, 15, 20 years depressed about something that they don't need to be depressed about. And so the first secret is understand what you have and get a positive team around you that can create a good plan for you so you can move forward with the disease. It sounds really simple, but let me tell you, the reason that I make that number one, the number one secret, is because I see people from all over the world, and this mistake is made over and over and over and over again. And it's just a fundamental thing that people need hope and they need to understand what, what they can do to improve their lives. And there's so much that can be done to improve the life. So this is a great quote by Joshua Harris. And Joshua Harris says, the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. Okay, so the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. And so what does that mean? Well, with Parkinson's disease, what it means is that the timing is critical. Okay? And Ken spit out this word. He said he, he studies this circuit in the brain called basal ganglia. And then you're all like, oh, my God, I'm gonna, I, if I wasn't caught in the middle here, I would have walked out because, you know, what the hell is the basal ganglia and what is this doing? But, but these circuits within the brain are cued circuits. They work on cues. They work on timing. Okay? And that's part of how these circuits are running the brain. And when Parkinson's disease changes over time, the medication therapies need to change over time, and the surgical therapies need to change, and we, we have to do lots of adjustments based on the symptoms. We actually have to listen. How about that? Your doctor has to listen to you to get it right and has to listen to you frequently at multiple visits a year to make sure that your timing is correct and you're going to be getting the best that you can from your medicines. It's not whether you have a purple pill or a fuchsia pill or a red pill or what. It has nothing to do with getting the latest type of medicine. There are dozens of different medicines. They're absolutely not going to give you the best benefit if you don't pay attention to the timing. Same with, uh, with giving rehabilitation strategies and how we administer exercise therapies and other therapies for this disease. The timing is absolutely critical, more critical than any expensive drug that you might see on TV uh, with a very pretty girl walking in and out of rooms and, and various, uh, various things that are supposed to make you buy these things and make them attractive to you. Timing is more important than any specific pill that anybody manufactures. I want you to remember that because it's important to this disease. This is a great quote by uh, Jared Kintz. He says, I have a favorite cemetery I like to go to because it's really clean and the doctors and nurses are all very nice. <laughs> I understand you have three of these <laughs> in, this, um, in this city in Pensacola. And so, so Jared says, I have a favorite cemetery I go to because it's really clean and the doctors and nurses are all very nice. So, you know, why is he telling us this? Okay, we came for a positive talk. The reason I'm telling you this is because we run at the Parkinson's Foundation these web forums. We've answered 30,000 questions. We have an Ask the Doctor forum from every continent except for Antarctica, although one of the patients said he would go to Antarctica and actually try to send a message in so we could say we've done it from all the continents. But 30,000 questions over the last decade, okay? And we know from interfacing, we have a free 1-800-4 Parkinson disease um, information line staffed by nurses that when patients go in the hospital, they check in, but they have lots of problems, and some of them don't check out. And it's because it's a complex disease. We have to know what medicines to give, what medicines not to give. We have to make sure the medicines are given on time every time. We need to understand the test. We need to understand you know, how to help the patients within that setting. And so one of the secrets is you have to survive the hospitalization. And so we got together as a group of, of centers of excellence. We have 43 centers of excellence at the Parkinson Foundation all over the world, and we wrote a whole bunch of papers. And you know what happened? Nothing. 
Because when a group of doctors get together and they write papers, nothing happens. There's no public health relevance to that. So we have to do something. And so what we decided to do was we decided to build these kits. And so Florence Nightingale said the first requirement in a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm. And so if you, if you have children, you know, when you have your first child, you're really keyed up, right? And, and, and when you're getting ready to go into the hospital, you pack a bag. And the bag has everything you need to survive the hospitalization or to help your, your spouse survive the hospitalization. And we need to do the same thing for our Parkinson patients. So we've given over 50,000 of these out. They're free. You can call the number. You can get online to Parkinson Foundation. They have a bracelet. They have um, information that you rip off and hand to the doctors and nurses. And it says, Parkinson Foundation says that you should do this and you should never give these medications and you should you know, give your medicines on time every time. You should do all of these things. And people get afraid. And so what happens is they get afraid. They say, well, I'm going to get sued if I don't do this because, you know, Parkinson's Foundation said this. And so it helps patients to understand how to navigate. And even in the worst circumstances, the other things we tell patients are tell the doctor to write an order in the chart, particularly if you have a good caregiver or care partner, that says you can administer the medications because you're going to be better than they are at administering the medications. And in fact, when we looked at it, this in research, three out of four patients weren't getting their medicines on time or weren't getting their medicines at all Okay, in, the, in this setting. And so it's so important and, and such, a, such a secret. And we've, we've seen too many tragedies happen. And so as we begin to move forward and take care of patients, we now have moved into preventative mode. Okay, so now we try to prevent patients from coming to the hospital. So I allow patients to walk in to our clinics at the University of Florida. We try to take care of them and try to keep them out of the hospital as much as possible. And because the hospital is not a good place because the, the people that are in the hospital, it's not their fault. They just don't understand um, how to handle these diseases. We haven't done a good job in teaching them. So you have to be the advocate and you have to make sure to protect them. And when we think about, about what is the future of therapies, this is a paper we wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association last year, and every academic shows a paper that has a slide that looks so complicated that you look at it and you can't see you know, what, what you need to see on the slide. But I just wanted to show you um, just a little spot here on this uh, slide. This is a little cool thing that Ken has that I'm going to steal, by the way. Right here, this is the beginning of the disease and what treatments we're supposed to be given. And if you look here, that little word says exercise. Look, we've changed the recommendation that at the outset of the disease, exercise, physical therapy, occupational speech, swallow therapy need to be started early in the disease. And that's a really important change and in something very important uh, to the success of people uh, as they move forward. And so keep that as a little pearl on the back of your mind. Now, there was a guy named Plato, and Plato said a lot of things, but one thing that he said was a lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being while movement and methodological physical exercise save and preserve it. And so Plato got it, and it turns out that exercise is like a drug for Parkinson's disease. We used to just say that because it sounds good, but now we actually have backed it up with multiple research studies and animals on little treadmills and people on little treadmills or slightly larger treadmills as well. And so there's lots of evidence now that as you exercise, you're stimulating the adenosine A2 receptor in the brain. And you can do this with coffee, tea, and exercise too. So hey, you know, that's good, right? And, and this, is, this is so important, and so important now that all the experts are beginning to get their patients to, to exercise. And it can have a profound symptomatic benefit. And some researchers are even looking into, it, will it modify the disease in some positive way? And Ken taught me earlier today that when you exercise, it, uh, it also has wide projections of, uh, of releasing a, a compound called BDNF. And that's one of the nutrients. We often say miracle, it's like miracle growth for the brain without having to stick a catheter in there. All you need to do is, is exercise. So it's a, it's a really important thing. And perhaps the most important thing is, is that at every visit, ask your doctor what's new. What's new in the disease? Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, whatever your disease is. If the answer is 
I don't know or I haven't looked, you might want to get a new doctor, okay? So this is just a super important question to always be asking and make sure that you're keeping them honest so they're always watching to see. And there's lots of new things. And so in the first book that we wrote for patients, we, we, we wrote that to help them. But then, of course, they, they said, you know, that was a nice book, lots of philosophy and everything, but we wanted a little bit of meat on the bones and you didn't deliver it. And so that's why we had to start to talk about some of the therapies in the, in the second book. And so let me just tell you about some of the research and some of the, the, the directions that things are going. This is a very nice quote by an African philosopher poet named Anoha who says, every challenge you encounter in life is a fork in the road. You have the choice to choose which way to go, backward, forward, break down, or break through. And I told you before, and I'm going to repeat it again because I think it's important, a breakthrough therapy for any disease does not have to be a stem cell. It does not have to be some amazing new, you know, techno gadget. A breakthrough can be how we address the disease for an individual person to make a difference in their lives. That, to me, is a breakthrough. Now, when we talk about forks in the road, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Yogi Berra, who said, I saw a fork in the road, and I took it. <laughs> okay. All right, one thing is for sure, we have to do something. We have to do the best we know how to do at the moment. It doesn't matter if it turns out right. We can modify it as we go along. Very important word, modification. Uh, the, that word was uh, used in this speech by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so one of the things that we are now working intently on is identifying compounds that will modify how the disease progresses over time. We can slow the disease down. And so there's a number of these, and we can do drug screenings, and we've come up with several from the research lab and from drug screenings that are even FDA approved that are on the shelf, like isratapine, a blood pressure medication, inazine for gout, exenatide for diabetes, malaria drugs. And so there's a number of these drugs that may have action against these diseases. But the problem is this. If we give a medication and you get better from the medication, how do we know that the medication's actually slowing or modifying the disease because you're getting an effect from that medication? So how do we measure that effect? Sounds simple, huge problem. So if we can't do that, we need 10,000, 20,000, we need huge numbers of people to answer that question of disease modification. And so the way that we're going about solving this problem is developing biomarkers. We call a biomarker, a marker of disease progression, of how things change over time. And so this is one such biomarker developed by David Valancourt at the University of Florida. And this is a marker of something called free water, or water that's sort of floating around in the brain. And he cleverly uses an MRI scan and looks at patients over multiple years with Parkinson disease from multiple different MRI scanners, because if it only works on one scanner, it only works on one scanner. So now looking at it internationally across four years, across multiple data sets, we're beginning to develop a method so we can measure what's happening in the brain. So we can do trials faster with smaller numbers of patients, and we can start to answer the question, does this therapy affect how the disease progresses? Fundamental question. We have had a problem. We've been crippled in developing blood biomarkers, biomarkers of the fluid that bathes the brain, imaging biomarkers. This is a direction that we need to continue to go. So when we test something like exercise in Parkinson's disease, how do we know if exercise modifies things? We have to have something that we can measure, particularly because when you exercise, your symptoms get better. So your scales get better, and so you have a symptomatic effect. So it's hard for us to tell if it's actually slowing the decline of the disease. And so this is really important. And so one of the breakthroughs has been multiple groups around the globe working on ways in which we can measure change over time so we can more quickly identify the therapies and bring them forward. We can spend less money and less time because you know, people with Parkinson's disease, they're anxious. They wanna, they wanna get to something now. And there's a great picture, um, a photograph by McGlynn of a man looking at his watch, standing on top of a globe, looking down at his watch. 
And I always think about that when I think about clinical trials for Parkinson. When I see people in the clinic, and what do they want to know? They're like, that's really nice, doc, but what do you got? You know, like, what, what do you got? You know, this is a really important problem that needs to be addressed now. Now, we also talk about techno-optimism, which is a new word. And techno-optimism is a belief in the power of technology to expand our sphere of possibilities. And the reason that extension, the word extension is so important in Parkinson is, is that if you know this disease, as things change over time, the medications begin to wear off and people can be on medicines as close to every two hours, every hour with dosages. The half-life of dopamine is very short. And so the development of patches, pumps under the skin with drugs like apomorphine, pumps into the stomach, drugs like Duopa, the ability to be able to deliver the medications over time so that when I ask a Parkinson patient, how many medications are you taking? When are you taking them? It takes me 15 minutes to go through medicines with, with patients. And my boss says, you can't spend that much time with patients. I said, well, if your mother gets Parkinson's disease, would you like me to understand what medication she's on? When your mother gets Parkinson's disease, if I ask her to hold her two hands out and put all the dosages of medicine for a single day, and she can't hold them in the same hands, I think we need to understand that better. And so the, the word extend is really important. And you can understand why the scientists need to keep pushing on these avenues because it's important to the patients, it's important to quality of life. We have effective therapies, but taking medicines that frequently can be very difficult. Robert Fanny said, I, I'd say we're all just ghosts on a wire seeking the prick of an electric thought. And it turns out that at the beginning of my career, um, we studied these circuits that are called the basal ganglia. So this is the part where you walk out, you say, oh, it's getting too complicated now. Um, and we, uh, my mentors and others before in animal models, um, they looked at the ability to push little amounts of electricity into these circuits, as much as is between my fingers, me tiny amounts of electricity, and drive these circuits up or down and affect the symptoms for people in really meaningful ways. And so a number of years ago, Dr. Foote, who's a neurosurgeon, and he and I have worked together for a couple of decades uh, on this work and been friends for even some time longer than that, gave this TED Talk. And during the TED Talk, we, we joke a little bit. We're not completely joking, but we, we joke at the beginning and the end, and we say, um, your brain controls everything, right? And we can control your brain. <laughs> he said, and people say, oh my God, you know, like this is, but you know, it's, it's not just in the technical, you know, elements of, of driving circuits with electricity. You can do this by driving circuits with medications or by exercise or other things, but it's just quite obvious when, when you know, somebody sticks a, a lead into your brain and pushes a little bit of electricity and changes the signal. And so the way that this field is now evolving, we're able to do some things that we, that we, uh, we haven't been able to uh, accomplish in the past, and it's getting very exciting. And so in my laboratory, we look at electrical signals. So control signals are biomarkers of electricity. So in the, the electricity and the squiggles, just like an EKG in the heart, are changing in the brain. If we record out of them, they're changing as your symptoms change. So if we can start to identify the symptoms that go with your particular problems, and we can have a device that can monitor that, and we can get the device to discharge and drive the circuit in one way or another, suddenly we have a very smart solution to, to this problem. And so these are pictures from patients who freeze with gait. And this is a, a grant we had from the Michael J. Fox Society, or Michael J. Fox Foundation, to develop an, a, what's called a closed loop or responsive symptom where the stimulator would come on when people began to have freezing or their legs or a single leg wouldn't move with Parkinson disease. We've also been able to uh, adapt this uh, for, for other uh, indications. Uh, this is a, a patient with tremor, and um, this video was actually shown on Monday by the um, 
I was, I was in China on Monday, but I got an email with a picture of Francis Collins, who's the current National Institutes of Health director. This is a, an NIH brain initiative grant led by Kelly Foote and Aisha Gundes at the, at the University of Florida. This is one of our patients with severe tremor. And the reason that Dr. Collins was showing this is that in the brain initiative that was launched during the Obama administration, uh, we're looking for more effective and better ways to treat these diseases that will have less side effects, and, and, and we're able to monitor the brain and try to understand what's happening within the brain and train that device to look at the squiggles and to say, these squiggles go with this symptom, and now we need to apply a little bit, look at my fingers, a tiny bit of electricity back to the brain to try to address the, the symptoms in the individual patient. And it can be quite disabling for patients. So you see in this uh, example, the tremor is intentional. So anytime he tries to do something and here this task is pouring, now we have our EKG, it's totally implantable. He doesn't even know it's on. His device is not on right now. These are just some sensors outside you know, to, to look at the EMG or the muscle activity. But when he goes to grab the cup, we're recording out of his cortex, the top of the brain, and we're recording out of his uh, thalamus. And we can track the signal, and immediately the device will tell the, um, the, the, the region of the brain that's not right and deliver stimulation current to uh, alleviate the tremor when he's trying to pour. So this is called personalized medicine. And so this is one of the things that we're very excited about uh, in the brain uh, initiative. The first place that we experimented uh, on this is for the past two decades I've been interested in Tourette and children with Tourette and where ticks come from in the brain. And so this is a patient with very severe ticks and we have a device completely implanted in her brain. So these are just external sensors again. And we're reading out of a, a place deep in the brain called the thalamus, that's the first line, M1 beta, M1 is the motor cortex, so the motor area of the brain. And the bottom is the detector and what this is, is a human tick detector. So ticks are paroxysmal activities. You don't tick all the time. And now we can record out of the brain and we can understand when the ticks are going to occur and apply a, a stimulus current to disrupt that tick and improve the quality of life. And so we've just implanted our sixth patient with a, a completely implantable uh, device on a National Institutes of Health study to address this problem, again, a personalized medicine problem to, a, to an issue that's not occurring 24-7 but can be completely disabling for patients that have severe tics. And patients who have freezing a gait, uh, this was uh, the squiggles that I showed you as the example uh, with patients with Parkinson disease. You see on the bottom there's, a, there's a, a blue line there and we're now tracking the signals as she walks out of an area called the PPN the paramedian nucleus that's deep in the, in the brain stem. And as she turns, it also changes. So there's a different signal. And so we're trying to understand those signals to, to treat walking dysfunction in patients. And as we move forward, the leads that we're putting in the brain are getting even more complex. And so we have a meeting where we take all the experts in the world on deep brain stimulation, about 100 of them. We host this meeting every year. In fact, we're going to have it next month in, um, in Atlanta, Georgia. And we lock them in a room, you know, like the Manhattan Project each year. And with a few rules, we say, check your egos at the door. We're here to work together. And you're not allowed to talk a lot with slides. So there are a limited number of slides and there has to be more time for discussion than there is for talk. No introductions like Ken gave me a nice introduction. No, none of that crap. We just, we're here to work. We all know who you are. Let's come on, let's get to work and fix these things. And so out of this tank have been multiple examples of new electrodes, new ways that we can stimulate. We can steer the current in different areas of the brain. And, and one of the projects that we're particularly interested in, this is another federal grant, uh, looking at how do we help people out in the community once they get these devices put in? Who's going to take care of all these people? Are you going to need to go seek out an expert like me every time you need to have an adjustment on devices? And so we've developing what's a mobile sort of support platform that runs on an iPad that a, that a nurse can, can use and then eventually patients can use and a telemedicine 
platform so we can handle these devices over time. So it's, the public health problem is maybe bigger than the technological problem. It takes 10 or 15 years for society to sort of accept and adapt to a new treatment. It takes even longer to actually deliver it in a way in which people can actually benefit all people, all races, all ethnicities. So super important. So William Foe said that vaccines are the tugboats of preventative health. And you say, well, what, wait a minute, what's he talking about? Vaccines and preventative I thought we were coming to a talk about Parkinson's and neurological disorders and things. But it turns out, it turns out that the immune system and the inflammatory system is, is very much involved in neurodegenerative diseases. And in these diseases, you get deposition of plaques, like you get plaque on your teeth, you get plaque on your brain, okay? And in these plaques are, are different proteins, one of which is called alpha A synuclein in Parkinson's disease. There's a protein, a different protein for Alzheimer's, a different protein for other diseases. And so we can actually now teach the immune system to respond to these abnormal proteins and clear them. And so this is uh, one of the vaccines that we're developing in our laboratory. Dr. Vidam Mai and I and, and Dwayne Mitchell, who's a brain tumor researcher, using ad adoptive immunity, the ability to teach the immune system what these things look like and then use your own immune system to go after them. The big question in these therapies, and there's a number of them that are being developed throughout the world now. One's in commercial testing as past um, safety testing. There's another one where they just give you antibodies in your vein. You know, they keep giving you antibodies and they go to these various areas and, and affect change. And so we know that we can manipulate the immune system to your benefit. If we clear the plaques off the brain, will we improve the disease? Will we cause side effects? Will it matter for patients? Can we measure the progression? Again, what the biomarkers, these are all unanswered questions, but certainly an exciting avenue that, that we're thinking of. So I'll close just by, by coming back to where I started. There aren't enough models of great care in the United States, in China, in um, the South Pacific, in South America, in Africa especially, we have the wrong models of care for neurological diseases. And so we need to create these service and science hubs. They make sense. They're gonna reduce complications for patients. They're gonna reduce the burden on the healthcare system. We have the same number of chess pieces on the board. We just need to move them in a different way. And this is really important. So this is um, the center at the University of Florida. We're getting ready to build a new center. This one's gonna be on steroids. So it has all the things that I talked about with the clinical trial center, but we're also embedding five laboratories into this in real time. So for biomarkers and modulation and for, for, um, for uh, other aspects of the research. Because remember, it's the people, it's you, that's going to teach us what we need to know and provide the substrate to move forward with these diseases. And so we have to put everything together in one place and move as quickly as we can because the clock is ticking. So thank you for the invitation to speak. It's been an honor uh, and a pleasure to, uh, to, to come here. I'd be happy to and very pleased to take questions. If you Google University of Florida and Oaken, you'll find a bunch of arrest records. No, <laughs> you'll, 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 you'll find my email address. It's publicly available. I work on a salary for the University of Florida. I'm a state employee. And so I'd be happy to answer your emails too by questions and I'd be happy to, to take <clears throat> any questions. So thank you very much. Let's start here. Thank you very much. Uh, we know that the nervous tissue, the brain is about 65 or 90% fat. And fat is very complex and uh, fat is very sensitive to chronic inflammation. Can you speak about the role of chronic inflammation in the, uh, for example, the, SAD, the standard American diet is 70% is, uh, of the standard American diet is highly inflammatory. Can you speak about the, the relationship between the chronic inflammation diet and neurological disease? And then part two of the question would be, 
in the 60s, uh, GMO wheat came online, uh, statins came online, fluoridation came online. Speak, is there any possibility of these technological advances could be neurological problems. Right. So let me summarize the question, two very good questions. One is about the brain is made up of lots of fats or lipids. And the, the second question is about the, the fact that there's all this inflammation, all these inflammatory things going on uh, in the brain, and should we be addressing the inflammation, and could this um, make a difference? And so the, the answer to the question one is yes. And true, uh, on multiple neurodegenerative diseases, there's all sorts of parts of the process, the, the, the fatty process that's involved. And people have looked at those as potential targets both to study but also for treatment. There hasn't been enough work on diet. So nutrition, gastrointestinal symptoms, and the microbiome, and understanding the microbiome, there hasn't been enough work on that to date. And inflammation is definitely involved in the disease. And in fact, it's one of the, the main uh, themes when you look at neurodegeneration. There's a number of things that happen in the brain. And so some people talk about oxidative stress, inflammation. There's a, a compound glutathione that's abnormal in the brain. There's a little energy producing area called the mitochondria, et cetera. All of these things are important. And then how the brain processes proteins and throws them away. And it doesn't do it normally in diseases like Parkinson and Alzheimer's, and they collect, and we need to understand that. So, so really important. Wouldn't it be cool if they could take that thing they have on TV that takes your fat away, you know, like that <laughs> freezes it away? Could freeze a little fat off the brain, but all right. Thank you for the question. So um, let's see, maybe back here in the, the back here. Thank you. Uh, I have a question as to what the current status of research is it, regarding is Parkinson's um, random, is it environmental, is it hereditary? Yes. Right. So, uh, so just to summarize your question, what's the current status of Parkinson? Where does it come from? Is it hereditary? What, where are we? What's the current state? Thank you for asking that question. It turns out that 90% of Parkinson's disease we don't know. Okay. And so 10%, 10%, that's one out of 10 people has a single gene defect, a single problem in their DNA that's related to the Parkinson that we're sure is causally related, causing that. So if that's true, then, then what's going on? And so there was a very famous University of California researcher that is quoted as saying, the genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. And everybody takes credit for that, but it actually, but the credit belongs in, in the great state of California for that statement. And it's, if you look at studies and multiple collective evidence and studies, there are environmental risk factors too that may be turning on the Parkinson or turning it on sooner. And so there are lots of things that are related in the environment, including pesticides, Agent Orange, you know, multiple uh, things that you might find in your garage, you know, like rotenone. And, and gardening uh, uh, things, uh, uh, things that are used to uh, and clean your shirts when you go to the dry cleaners. Some of those organochlorines, organophosphates are associated with Parkinson. And so, so there's sort of this unknown, and then there's this idea of what's going on between the gene and the environment that may result in the disease. Okay, so if that's not complicated enough, now I'm going to give you the zinger, okay? The zinger is Parkinson is not one disease. Parkinson is not one disease. It's a collection of symptoms like tremor, stiffness, slowness, these 20 some odd motor and non-motor symptoms. It's a collection of those symptoms and we clump them together because that's what we do as humans because they kind of look the same, but they're not all the same. You know, even in the 10% that are genetic, there's a whole bunch of different genes in that, in that pile, okay? And so, so it makes it, it adds a layer of complexity because we simplify it by collapsing it. But as we unravel the puzzle and as we develop therapies and as we develop personalized medicine, we'll begin to look at the pathways that are affected by the genes and the environment and hopefully we'll guide our choice of therapeutics or potential therapeutics in drugs and other areas versus what's actually going on in an individual person's brain. So. Um, how about this this gentleman in the back here? Try to give equal time to the back. 
Um, I always tell my son at school, he's 10, only raise your hand once, even if you know all the answers right. to the question. <laughs> oh, you and I spoke briefly yeah. about the use of music and uh, getting Parkinson's people to uh, move. What you, since you just came back from China, anything about Tai Chi, since that's often um, automatic yes. movement? Thank you for the question. Um, I, I had a, um, a book signing at Beijing Rehabilitation Hospital 48 hours ago. And uh, like it's, it's World Parkinson Day there, and so the, the hospital was packed with people. And, um, and so I, I w walked in and gave some remarks, sat down to sign some books, and they said, hold up. And a woman walks up onto the, into the middle of the things, and all, a bunch of people walk up, like, and you know, it, it, this was too coordinated for America. We could never pull this off. <laughs> And they walk up and, and they start doing Tai Chi. They have a 15 minute Tai Chi for all the Parkinson. The Parkinson patients start to move and, and, and come alive. Exercise, all forms of exercise improve Parkinson symptomatically. There's a paper from Oregon in the New England Journal of Medicine that appeared about five years ago on Parkinson disease. Not to say the New England Journal of Medicine is always right, but there are multiple papers that, that suggest that, that this form of exercise in particular, some forms of, of meditation, cycling, forced cycling also has been another uh, area that's been shown with, with some evidence to be uh, positive. And so we don't know exactly what's going on. <clears throat> Stimulation of adenosine receptors may be um, BDNF, miracle growth factors coming out, other things that we don't understand. But sometimes we don't need to understand to know that people are getting better. And so we have the largest longitudinal study of Parkinson disease ever attempted. It's going into its sixth year now at the Parkinson's Foundation. And we collect one page of data on every patient every year, modeled after the cystic fibrosis project where they did this and they increase the lifespan of CF kids and young adults by 10 years by just understanding which centers the patients were doing better and then applying the therapies from those centers. We now know that exercise helps and so we're, we're telling everybody to do it like I showed you in the JAMA article. Okay, how about somebody in the front for equal, equal time here? Thank you. I understand the attraction of being at a major medical training facility and research facility, but you said earlier in your lecture that you learn a lot from interaction with patients too. What can we as a community do to get some of your young movement disorder specialists to relocate to Pensacola? Right. So, um, so just to re encapsulate the, the, the question, is, um, is, was, was a very, uh, very nice uh, attempt to to get our doctors from academics to move out into the community and take care of Pensacola. Um, I joke a little bit, but, um, but this is a huge problem. Um, does anybody know the number of Parkinson disease and movement disorder specialists? These are neurologists who have finished neurology training who choose to do the training in Parkinson and movement disorders. How many are trained in the United States per year? How many? Here, 100. Okay. How many people in the United States have Parkinson's disease? Between a million and a million and a half, and we just finished a, a, a verification study at the Parkinson Foundation on that. Okay. There is no competition like for between practitioners. People that argue over Parkinson patients, if I'm part of that discussion as the medical director of the park, I tell them all to be quiet and go back to their offices. There's plenty of patients to go around. There are only 40, four zero specialists trained in the United States each year on Parkinson disease. We could train Parkinson specialists at this rate and we will continue to, to get behind, further and further and further behind. Medicare, unlike cardiology and nephrology and, and other specialties, does not cover Parkinson specialty training. So only places that are have academic faculty that can get grants and other ways to pay for these kids, we often are pay for them through philanthropy. So we often communities and people will pay the, the tuition and things and the books and things for these young residents to get training. And so it, it's a huge problem. And so 
Part of the problem is going to be train more Parkinson specialists and convince the government that you've got issues. Now, in China, all the previous presidents, the last several of them, uh, have gotten Parkinson disease, <laughs> including the last one before President Xi. And so, you know, as I was there, you know, even at the military hospital 301 in Beijing, which has 3,400 beds, they're, they're, they are motivated. They understand that this is a problem, and they, they're sending more people over to be trained probably than it, from other countries than we're training ourselves. And so this is a huge critical crisis and, and something that we're going to have to address and also teach other doctors and other specialties how to handle this better and do a better job in education so that we can meet the public health crisis. It's a, it's a problem. We have time so, for one more question. Okay, one more question. How about in the middle somewhere? How about this young lady right here? Could you comment on Parkinson Plus, the MS, MSA, the PSP, and the CBG, CBD? Because it seems like my husband has MSA, and whenever he does exercise, he's paralyzed for the next three days. It, it does not help him. And, and yet, you know, it does help him mentally. Yes, thank you for the question. And so the, to, to repeat the question, the question is, is can you comment about Parkinson's Plus, in particular MSA, which stands for multiple system atrophy? Um, and, and when her husband exercises, it actually makes him worse. So, um, so Parkinson Plus is a term that, that uh, you know, was put in the literature. It's not the greatest term. Some people also say atypical. Parkinsonism and or Parkinsonism. So these are features that may share in common with Parkinson disease, but these patients don't have the same medication response, nor do they have the same disease. And when they're done with their brains, they turn them in sometimes, and I never recommend to people to turn your brains in until you're completely done with it. But if you're done with it, okay, and you, and you look at the proteins in the brain, Alpha-synuclein is in the brains of patients with multiple system atrophy that look a lot like Parkinson's disease, and it's in um, uh, multiple system atrophy. So Parkinson and MSA both share the same protein, but the MSA patients have another little protein inclusion called an oligodendroglial inclusion. That's a mouthful, okay? So it's a different disease with similar symptoms, probably because it's picking on similar circuits in the brain. Many of the patients have problems with blood pressure, dizziness when they stand up, walking problems, uh, erectile dysfunction, other things that affect the automatic or autonomic nervous system, digestion, very severe constipation. And, and so the medications in some but not all of those cases don't work as well as in Parkinson. And some of the therapies that we recommend, like exercise, can make people worse. So it's all the more important to get to a specialist to make sure you're getting guided in the right direction to make sure that you're getting the right therapy for the right patient and the right person. We say when you've met one Parkinson or Parkinsonism patient, you've met one patient. And even if somebody to your left or right is taking a purple pill or a yellow pill or doing this type of exercise or that type of therapy, it might actually not be good for you. And when we do interdisciplinary care, more times than not, we have patients seen by physical, occupational, speech, and swallow therapists, and they say, well, I've already seen a physical therapist. Thank you very much, Dr. Oak, and, you know, but I'm not going to see another therapist again. And it made me worse. And, and the thing that we've learned that's been quite humbling is, is that many of the therapists aren't trained in these diseases, and they will have you doing the wrong things for your symptoms, and it can actually make you more unsteady, make you more apt to fall, fracture your hip, injure yourself. And so it's really important to have the interdisciplinary care in all of these diseases, whether it's Parkinson or not. So I'm not thoughtful the answer. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you.